And welcome back to another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. Today, we are joined by a Mr. Richard Grannon. Richard Grannon is a NLP Master Practitioner. For those of you who don't know yet what NLP is, we will get into that, but it stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. It's some real James Bond psychological stuff. And uh, Richard Grannon is formerly of Street Fight Secrets, streetfightsecrets.com which is actually how I discovered him back in the day. He had several, more than several um, audio programs and DVDs come out, uh, Offensive Psychology, uh, NLP in the Cycle, uh, Offensive Psychology, NLP, and um, uh, the Psychology of, of Violence, the Destructive Cycle, which is a number of them that I picked up and purchased and listened to. And uh, Richard just has a lot going on. Right now he is um, doing the Spartan Life, Co- Life Coach program where he helps guys, you know, figure out, you know, relationships and their personal lives and just coaches, you know, guys on so much more than just relationships, just kind of a a life coach in general. Um, And I've got his resume right in front of me right here, guys, and there's a lot to it. So instead of just reading off all of this, like accomplishment after accomplishment, I'm just going to say, Richard, welcome on to the podcast, man. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's It's a real pleasure. Thank you. So um, I want to jump right into it, man. And I think what is on everybody's mind that I've talked to um, about you is what happened to Street Fight Secrets? And is it true that Alex Jones um, may or may not have been integral in shutting you down? Um, street, the Street Fight Secrets, the website is, is still going. Um, it's still up there. And uh, I may produce some more material. Uh, it's becoming more urgent and relevant in the times that we're living through and the times that we're enduring. Um, the Alex Jones connection. Um, yes, as far as I'm aware, either Alex Jones or people who were working for him, uh, went through a campaign of, uh, basically flagging, uh, my videos. Uh, this is back in 2012. They also released articles on the Alex Jones website. Really strange thing for him uh, to, to say. The stance that he took was uh, the, the article said certain self-defense instructors are encouraging violence. And then the pictures in these articles were still shots from my videos. So he didn't say my name. He just said certain self-defense instructors are being irresponsible. The reason for this, though, is because um, I kept fact-checking him. And uh, I slightly autistically um, and perhaps a little too loudly and not very diplomatically, uh, whenever he or any of his guests would, would say things that simply weren't true, I would, I would fact check. I would say, this is not true. Um, it was a mistake. <laughs> yeah. And I paid for it with my channel. <laughs> You know, the interesting thing is he's made a series of mistakes as well and now paid for it with his channel. So call that karma or whatever it may be. Yeah, I mean, and, and it, it was when it happened and he got, he got, he got uh, cancelled or deleted or banned from YouTube. It was, it did feel like karma. It was a pyrrhic victory though because as the years went by and, you know, that happened in 2012 um, it forced me to move into uh, a different, a different direction, one that I enjoy an awful lot more. Um, I would say at this point in the reality that we live in, I'm far more on his side than not. Mm-hmm. Um, he is a, um, somebody who challenges the mainstream narrative has done for a very, very long time. Um, some of his guests and he himself have said, preposterous things like they, they, the only reason I was saying my whole thing with it was don't piss in the punch. Don't say dumb shit that ruins the points that you're making. You're making really valid points, but uh, I mean, you know, the, the, there was certain, I mean, he's actually apologized for some of the things that he said around uh, certain shootings, but when the Fort hood shootings came out, there was a series of videos that he released that were just counterfactual. They're just for the Fort Hood shootings were interesting enough without him and the various guests that he had on spouting utter nonsense. But that's all, as far as I'm concerned, that's all, that's all by the by. Uh, we need more people like 
like Alex Jones in the world, especially now. And so, yeah, that's the Alex Jones story in a nutshell. You know, it's funny you bring that up as far as, um, and I think it's really, I don't even want to use the word diplomatic, <clears throat> but it's really just um, very manly of you to say, hey, listen, Alex Jones has his points. He's got good points and we need more guys like him out there, even though everything he did to you, man, which is absurd. And I want to kind of touch back and circle back to that in a minute here. But let me just say, I, I think you're absolutely right about him. Um, you know, I've watched him for a number of years and a lot of what he says is on point, but then he just goes into these tirades about weird stuff, man. And it's like, what are you, what are you talk, What are you thinking? And it just, it totally discredits him from anything that he might have said that was correct. Yeah. There's, there's the delusional rants and then there's the marketing side of it. We all have to make money. Um, but there's a, I truly believe that you can make good money without, without, being a clown without making a complete spectacle of yourself. Um, and as far as the, the rants go, he, he's, he's, not, he's not mentally well. He has a lot of unresolved um, mental health issues himself. Used to drink, obviously copes with food and, and probably some over-the-counter drugs as well. And, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a melange of things there that of, anybody could just listen to Alex Jones for a minute. No, he's, he's not all there. Um, <laughs> But, but in the essence of what he's doing, which is challenging the mainstream narrative, I, I, uh, I support his cause and, and, and other people like him. Always have. Always have. You bring up making money and, you know, guys like you and, you know, now guys like me, we, we have to make money and we want to make money and be successful at what we do. But, you know, I got to tell you, man, it's difficult and it really is. But you seem to have really done a very good job, not only at marketing, but also selling content that is extremely valuable. Um, how did you get into this whole psychology and everything? Now, I know you have a degree in psychology, but you were also before that uh, a doorman, a professional doorman. So yeah. where did this whole um, psychology of violence really take off for you? The, well, as, as, far, as far as the money making goes, when I was a doorman, um, it, it was, I became a doorman whilst I was waiting me as an officer um and i basically you know a very classic story i got sucked into that whole world i got sucked into the drugs girls fighting all of that and it, it the army just never happened um and so i felt like a bit of a, a a loser like a bit of a failure and um i wasn't obviously door work is just a crap way of making money it's really hard to make money unless you are committing crimes at the same time which i wasn't and so I, I wanted to learn how to make money on this thing called the internet, which I knew nothing about. I didn't even use email at the time. The internet connection I had was AOL, the America Online, you know, where it made the funny noise, ba ding, ba ding, when you like dial in. So I got um, a series of DVDs by a, a Canadian chap called Cory Riddell that was how to make information products. Hmm. And I just, um, I devoured it, studied it, and did everything that he said, followed the rules. And, uh, I, I stuck with the, the the strategies that he put out in 2003 are not different than than they are now, really. In essence, though, though the machine that the internet is is upgraded, the the essence of marketing hasn't changed. Um, I am a capitalist. I think it is a good thing to make money. I think it's it's one of the subjects in my life that I would say I'm still very passionate about is sales marketing. If you can give people a good product or a service, charge them a good price for it, that's a beautiful thing. Everybody wins, and that's 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 a. It's a to me, it's a red-blooded endeavor. It's a it's a, it's a good thing to be doing. Um, obviously, there are certain markets that are tougher than others. Self-defense is is a is a tough market because the people you're speaking to, uh, the the guys that I spoke to, a lot of them were like blue-collar guys. They already had family and kids and mortgage payments. There wasn't a ton of money just floating around. Yeah. So um, so so moving into a different market. The, the uh, Spartan Life Coach was actually set up to help those blue collar guys with the abusive relationships they were in as they were going through divorces. Um, and it, you know, really, it, it kind of got taken over by a focus on narcissistic abuse. And that's what, which is, that was in 2012. Every year between 2012 and 2020, narcissistic abuse has become more and more mainstream. And I just rode that, that wave up. Everybody's talking about narcissism now where back in 2012 it was still very niche so i i kind of i got lucky as well on that one you know 
it's funny you bring that up because I recently found you again after a number of years. And it was because my brother was dating a complete narcissist girl. Mm -hmm. And she was living with us during the quarantine and everything here in the States. And I literally turned on your YouTube channel, man. And boom, like everything you were saying, I was like, holy shit, like, wow. And I think that really becomes more and more prevalent these days, especially with American women. Um, it's funny, but it's not funny at the same time. I really, really do believe, and I don't think this is a conspiracy theory, that for whatever reason, American women specifically, but also European women, women to some degree, have become very, very um, narcissistic and very, I don't know, man, like almost damaged, like something's happened to them. Can you chime in on that in any way? Yeah. Um, it, th- Things, well, how should I approach this one? I could go full Alex Jones on it. Um, I, it seems to me to be the case that, um, like the chap, what's it, he's Yuri Brezhnev or Yuri Bezmanov. I don't know if you've seen his interviews. This, uh, he's, an ex, ex, um, he's a journalist from Russia, and he talks about how there's a Soviet conspiracy afoot in America to slowly brainwash people, to demoralize people and pull America apart. And he's on American TV. It was shot in the late, in, sorry, in the early 80s. Um, Yuri Bezmenov or Bresmenov, somebody will write it in the comments. It's really good. Um, but he was talking about how in order to fight an enemy who's physically larger than you, you have to break them down mentally and emotionally. You demoralize them. You subvert their values you make up and up is down, in is out, left is right, right is wrong. Um, and you break up the nuclear family. And it's this, he, he described it as a Marxist Leninist conspiracy. And you watch these things and you go, oh, that's interesting. Obviously, he's completely bonkers and anybody who believes this is bonkers. And then after condemning them as being mad, we see these things playing out. There is no doubt there has been a deliberate, ongoing, consistent propaganda style attack on relationships between men and women in every way possible. Um, Probably starting from the, I think we can say from the 1960s to now. And the effect of that has been disastrous in terms of demoralizing a nation. What a fantastic way to get the job done. Men and women are designed to be with each other. We're wired through evolution to be with each other. There's nothing more, it, it lends love lends meaning to life. Safe attachment with a member of the opposite sex, um, if you're heterosexual, is about the most significant, gratifying, fulfilling experience you can have. And it's been taken away. In its stead, we have massive amounts of mental illness, massive amounts of anxiety and depression. When people are very lonely and very isolated, they're much easier to persuade, they're much easier to control, they're much easier to sell to. The men and women of World War II, for example, who fought uh, and died in that war, they were from loving families. Now, they weren't perfect. It was a, it was a harder time. Uh, they wouldn't stand up to the uh, value systems that we hold today. But they came from loving nuclear families. You know, there would be a mother and a father and the kids, and they would live together, yeah. <laughs> for example. Revolutionary concepts, you know, it's, it's barely, it just never happens now. And so um, I think we can say that if we look at it from a military strategy point of view, in terms of psyops, it's a great way of demoralizing the enemy before a single shot is fired. Make it so they can't be asked to fight. Make them fat. Make them stupid. Make them addicted to porn. Make them lazy. Make them not hate values, but just show utter contempt to value. So you talk to people about loyalty and honor now. And you get this apathetic sneer that everything gets. Everything is dealt with an apathetic sneer. And you think, well, how the fuck do you think society is supposed to bind itself together and hold itself together with no love, no honor, no truth, no value? It's impossible. It's totally impossible. So there does seem to have been um, like a a brainwashing schedule, a, a, a propagandization the, the counter theory to this is that it was about nothing more than capitalism. Uh, the corporations, they realized that if they could convince women that they didn't need no man and that they uh, could get them into the workplace and they could compete with men and make as much money as men, then they would be doubling or massively increasing their labor force 
whilst deliberately paying women less. So they're getting a lot more labor, much more cheaply. And the ideology that pushed that would be one that says women should go to work. So it's a, that, I like that. I don't think that's the truth, but I like that. I think there's a lot to it because the irony of it is it's freedom, it's liberation, it's freedom, it's liberation for women as they, did, as they push themselves back into wage slavery. So, so I think there's, there's multiple elements to it, but there's, there's, there's definitely a problem. Nobody can doubt that there's a problem. Just look at the divorce rates. Yeah. The, the final thing I would say about the, the man-woman situation that we're dealing with, all of society is more narcissistic now. It's incredibly narcissistic, materialistic. Um, there, there isn't an equivalence to feminism in the environment for men. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think this is the kind of thing one gets in trouble for saying. I do think women are more um, susceptible to propaganda yes. than men. I'm not saying men aren't susceptible to it, but women have more trait openness. Men will be more inclined to say, fuck you, that's not about me, I reject it. Women will be less inclined to do that. And if, they, if there is a, a sense that this is what women are doing, then I think there's more of a tendency to go along with it. And so the propaganda has basically led us to a place where there's broad scale uh, confrontation, narcissism, just absurd amounts of entitlement and this new victimhood narrative, which is incredible. You know, I, I hear it all the time, especially from American women, that they are the greatest, most oppressed, most victimized people in the world. And I always say, I've lived in the world. I've traveled, lived in multiple countries. I can't think of a class of human being with more privileges than a white American woman. I, I, I literally can't think, of, and, but at the same time, they want to say we're the, we're the most oppressed, where we have suffered under years of rape, torture, and genocide. And I'm thinking, like, get out of America, get into the world. I can show you places where there's been literal rape, literal genocide, literal oppression. This is, but this is the effect of propaganda. If you don't know, what do you, what do you, you know, you don't know what you don't know, right? And you, you say that, you know, women are kind of psychologically more susceptible to kind of going along with the crowd and everything. But this is, this is not conspiracy, man. This is something ad companies have known since the fifties. It's just women are more likely to go ahead. And if other women are doing it, that's what they want to do as well. They, they're easier to sell stuff to. It's just. Yeah. The that's a, the psycho psychology research that backs this. Um, it's proven multiple times. It's, it's, if you're targeting uh, products to a family unit, you, you, it, you're going to do better. You're going to sell more if you target to the mother of the household than the father of the household. It's, it's, it's been proven time and again. You also mentioned the fact, the fact that, you know, look, Americans don't travel that much. And I think that is one of the reasons that it is easier to tell us, you, you know, you women are victims or even for guys like you, we see it right now in the, the black lives matter movement, which, Hey, I'm all for equality and everything, man. I've traveled way too much to be racist in any way. I'm too cultured. But at the same point, you've got these people being told you're oppressed, you're oppressed, you're, you know, this, whatever. And you see these violent terroristic movements come out of that where people mm -hmm. are burning stores down and everything. And, and I'm not saying it's specifically the BLM movement. It's a wide range of, in my personal opinion, communist, yeah. you know, forces that are doing this, but it's the type of thing where, listen, you know, uh, Richard, you've traveled extensively. Um, I have as well, the Middle East, Asia, certain other, you know, um, Latin American countries. Life is hard, man. And if you're like stepping out of line, you'll be killed. Yeah. It's not like that in Europe. It's not like that in the States. So the fact that people don't understand how good we have it is amazing to me, but it also does kind of go to that point saying, there is a larger plan here and people are being told, I think, what people, what the powers that be want people to be told. I think so. I think there's a, there's, there can be a conspiracy that, um, without it being an overarching conspiracy, I think the population is moving in a certain direction and then there are bad actors. There are elite level people who are riding the wave of what was coming anyway. Um, so, we say, you know, with the, with the BLM movement, with the political entity that is the BLM movement, fuck those guys. They're Marxists. Yeah. They're Marxists. Fuck them. Anybody who says, well, we don't want black people being oppressed, I would say, fuck yeah. I don't want any ethnic yeah. minority being oppressed. I don't want... It was fucking hard to watch a video of a man being slowly suffocated to death. I think the 
natural human instinct was to kill the man before he could do the killing, you know, like it was to kill Derek. You know, I think most of us would have inflicted a heavy violence upon him. Were we there and were we able to? These things have been racialized where they shouldn't be racialized. These things have been determined to be about race where sometimes they're, they're really not. I've spoken to a few people about this. I spoke to TJ about it. I, I, I'm not convinced the irony with the um, George and Derek case is I'm not convinced there's any racism involved in that at all. Yeah. I think they're two bad men. They were two bad men. And they worked the door together. They had pre-existing beef. Maybe George fucked a bar girl that Derek was trying to fuck. I don't know. And um, Derek is a piece of shit who belongs in jail. And he will go to jail uh, for a long period of time. George was to be killed that day. Nobody's saying that. I haven't heard anybody say that, by the way. Not one person. Not one right-wing, lunatic, Nazi extremist who's come out and said, that guy deserved to die. Not heard anybody say that. So in a sense, we're all actually more united than we seem. Right. That was wrong. We don't like that. We don't want that. But we got lost in the race narrative. Not that race isn't an issue. But on that occasion, my the thing I was trying to say to people, but it got lost in the hysteria, was focus on the fact that there was a group of people who were white and Asian, who were cops, who were party to a crime, who were fired for that crime, not arrested. Whoever made that decision, we need to have a conversation with them. And we need to say, why, why would you do that? The punishment for me showing up late to my job at McDonald's is being fired. Yeah. You, these guys killed a man or they were you know, party to killing a man. They should have been arrested. Even if they were arrested and then released two weeks later, what we all felt was, hey, the law's not being applied here. Ah, then you will have violence. You, you will have, I'm not condoning it. But at the same time, I would say you can't expect people to just sit back, watch something really graphic and awful like that. That's extremely emotive right after we've all been under house arrest for a couple of months and not expect to push back. And it was, it was mishandled. It was really, really mishandled. What should have been done is there should have been, a, a, you know, a, a real, even, even at a symbolic level, it would be nice to see, okay, we have to investigate this. We have to stop this. We can't have police going around with guns thinking that the law doesn't apply to them. That's a fucking problem. And then they would have said, well, they don't. And I would have said, but they did. Derek did that because he knew the boys club would protect him. And I don't know what happens when you get fired in Minnesota. I don't know whether that doesn't mean you can't set up in Texas and get hired as a cop again, you know? So there, there were issues there, but it got lost because it got racialized. And everybody who racialized that should feel bad. You're, you're bad people. You made the world a worse place. You turned a human against human. And it was never that. It was never, a, a, you know, there are race problems, but that I don't think was a case of racism. We lost, we lost the, uh, the real issue there. And I'm glad you bring that up because, you know, you say, look, there are race problems and there always have been. And I, as a white dude, like, I don't know necessarily what it's like to grow up black in America, right? Like, okay, I get that. But now you've got like the race issue so to the forefront that we're being torn apart as a society. And it's not happening just here in the States. Now I look at the UK as well. And yeah. it's as a white guy right now, I'm going to just say this. It's dangerous to walk around in a city. Um, I was in New York the other night and I had stuff thrown at my truck. I had I'd been called a cracker a number of times. I had a guy trying to flag me down. I'm assuming to mug me. Like it's, mm -hmm. um, it's not great right now to be white in a city in America. And this is, I bring this up to say that we're all Americans. We're all, you know, if you're in Britain, you're, you're all Brits, right? Why can't we just unite against a common enemy, which, you know, whatever that is, whether that be, you know, China or whatever it is, the, the terrorism, um, it's almost like it was a concerted effort to tear us apart as a people rather than have us come together. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, I was for the BLM movement when it first came out and my, uh, black and, uh, one Latino friend through Instagram who we regularly share conspiracy theory material with, they all were messaging me going, one guy said, this is a false flag. I'm like, I don't think it's a false flag, but they all said, 
don't be down for BLM. You don't understand what that is. So there is a great awareness and a great pushback uh, against this in, in, in the black community, for sure. And there are people of color who are totally aware that this is, this is nonsense. It was interesting because at that time, with where we were up to with the plague, um, all the conspiracy movements were coming together mm -hmm. at that time, right as it happened, right as it happened. And everybody was saying, hey, fuck the government. I think there was going to be riots. I think there was going to be riots anyway, but we might have joined, unified, and fought the real enemy. So they very cleverly said, okay, like you, like you just said, let's have, them, let's have them divided. Let's have them attacking each other. Let's have them falling out um, over this fallacious concept, which is race, which by the way, totally non-scientific. Race only applies to plants. It's a, it's a definition for plants. It's a non-scientific uh, denomination. Okay, we are where we are in history. Oh, I looked it up last night, by the way. Do you know when the Emancipation Proclamation was, was made? Do you know roughly when it was made? Was that around 1884, 86, something like that? Okay, you, you're way closer than me. I thought it was the 1700s. It was 1862. Okay. So I was sat there thinking about this, and I was like, wow. Okay, so slavery, okay, 1862 to 1962, the riots in 1962. Oh. That's 100 years. Yeah. It's fucking nothing. It's nothing. It, in, terms of, in terms of the history of what happened, it's nothing. There is, there is a wound there that, that needs, it needs to be healed. I am not for handouts. I'm not for the concept of reparations. I just don't work like that. I, I think it's poisonous. I don't think it, I don't think it strengthens anybody. But there is a gaping wound on the side of America that's never really been tended to. Because when you look at that history where um, people were taken from Africa by Africans, by North Africans, sold by Muslim Africans, the Moors, to the Brits, uh, the Dutch, the Portuguese, and the Spanish, they were, um, they were deliberately choosing people who couldn't read and write. They were deliberately choosing people who were non-Muslim. Kufar, they were choosing the Kufar. Then they would take them over there. They had different tribes uh, who spoke different languages pushed together into the same plantation so they couldn't talk. They could learn English, but they were only allowed to learn pidgin English. If they learned to read or write, you could be killed for it. So there's this deliberate um, crippling, psychological crippling intergenerationally for hundreds of years. And then it was, you're free. F free, free to do fucking what? And there's never been, there's never been a reintegration, which you, you need. And we're too close historically. Because in my head, I was like, oh, okay, if this was a sci-fi story, how long do you think it would take for, to go from the moment of freedom to, okay, we're reintegrated? And I was like, that's 400 years. Well, we don't have fucking 400 years for this. Time. We've, we've got to do something. I don't know what, but there needs to be some kind of redressing of, of, the, of the imbalance there because there, there, there is an imbalance. There is a historical injustice that, that has to be addressed to some, to some people's satisfaction. We'll never have full justice. You can't. Life doesn't work like that. History's never worked like that. Um, there's, never been, there's never been justice for slavery that I'm aware of anywhere in the world at any time. When it was whites being stolen by the Moors, by the Barbary pirates, when it was Vikings stealing Britons to be slaves, there's no justice. But this is very close historically. This just happened. We've got. I think. I think it needs addressing, and I think that's what we're saying now. I think so. And there's something to be said about the hundred year cycle as well. It seems like every hundred years something pops off. Right. Right. So when it comes to um, defending yourself. I mean, specifically psychologically, and this is something I'm big on. And, you know, I've never really made any courses about this. I was actually in the process of making some courses to help guys when it comes to dealing with women, um, not be pussy with, not be a bitch type of thing. And it honestly, <laughs> man, it was out on the market for a couple of weeks. I didn't have one bite. And it seems like guys just don't want to help themselves. And I'm not saying that's because I didn't sell any products, but I'm saying this because I've seen it in general is that um, a lot of guys, when it comes to dealing with their personal defense, they think, let me get a weapon, let me learn how to fight, let me do MMA or whatever, but they don't take into account that most fighting is done these days psychologically, whether that's defending yourself from your girlfriend's attacks or you know, on the street, because guys just, they, we don't fight with fists anymore. We fight with our, with our words, with our minds. Um, yeah. Can you give us some kind of basic principles that we could live by 
as far yeah. as psychological self-defense? Um, yeah, I can, I can give uh, su super basic principles. Um, a lot of stuff guys would have already heard before. Um, but, you know, one of the things I always stick to is prevention is better than cure. If you can avoid it, avoid it. So um, it's, it's, and that, that always comes down to like basic common sense. Like don't go to places where fights happen. Don't be in a club with a bunch of young guys on badly cut coke. You know, 20 guys fighting each other for the attention of four women. You see that in a club, find another fucking club. Um, you know, avoid places when people are drunk, when they're on drugs. That's where massively uh, most of the violence happens. If you interview prisoners and they're in prison because of violence assault, only a tiny minority are there without drugs and alcohol having been a huge effect in, uh, in the violence assault. So uh, Saturday nights, Friday nights, Thursday nights, these are the times when people get their heads stomped on. Um, the rest of the time, common sense you know don't lead with your with your ego stay focused on whatever it is you're trying to do when there's a road rage incident and you have the opportunity to get out of the car and show how big your willy is stay in the car mm -hmm. and drive away the vehicle is actually quite protective it moves at 60 to 100 miles an hour and you know you can run people over with it just stay in the car um a, a lot of it is 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 personal it's it's you versus you if you're very insecure very emotionally dysregulated, very angry, you may even find yourself going out looking for violence. That's what I did. I didn't need to be in a world of violence. Uh, I didn't need to be rolling around on the floor with people sticking my fingers in their eyes. I put myself there because I was mentally unwell. I was, before we did the interview, actually, I was just thinking the other day, a lot of stuff that I taught that was uh, unarmed was, was really was quite nasty, quite visceral stuff. And I was like, who needs this really? Who, who, who needs this? If you're special forces, you have weapons. Yeah. If you're a cop, you've got a gun. If you're like, and I was like, when would you need this? It's a very, very small slice of a potential reality where you would need to turn on a dime and become hyper-aggressive and mash another human being into next week and you know, give them life-altering injuries. It's a very, very small uh, uh, um, section of life where that happens um, you know and this is even I speak to guys who do private security work over in Afghanistan and Iraq and it, it's bad but they're not it's not like they're getting into all kinds of contacts all the time right at the moment so if you can get if you can go to Iraq and Afghanistan without actually nearing to needing to fire a live round and fill out a form for three months we should be able to walk through our town centers without it now as you just said, times are changing. Uh, I've seen what New York is like. Um, I know a cop in New York, and he said in, he's, uh, he's actually a black cop. He said in 23 years, he's never seen anything like this. So nothing comes close to this. Okay, can you avoid uh, being in that area? And if you are going to go through, I wouldn't be relying on my fucking amazing wrestling skills, which I don't have because I don't train enough these days. Um, I, I'd be tooled up. And even, even that, like, if you need to tool up, do you have to go? <laughs> like, do you like it's it? You know, <laughs> and even if even if you go with a group of guys and you're all tooled up, if there's a mob, you're fucked. I mean, didn't that? It was Black Hawk Down. Yeah, down wasn't it? Where they got the Navy SEALs got taken down by a mob who were high and couldn't shoot straight. But even if you're really good at killing people by shooting them in the head, you run out of ammo eventually, or you'll get swarmed by thugs with machetes and bottles, and that will be the end of you. Yeah, not to mention the fact that a lot of places, um, even in the States these days, you can't tool up, man. It's just illegal, and, uh, you know, you, you, you can't bring your Glock anymore. It's just not, it's not how it goes, and it's not the Wild West as far as legal citizens are concerned. Um, right. So is, it, going, is New York, can you not, you can't conceal carry in New York? Not unless you're law enforcement. Oh, shit, I didn't know that. Yeah, a whole tri-state area, which would be like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, pretty much the whole eastern seaboard and the west coast these days, you... Um, at least part of the West Coast. You can't carry unless you're a cop. It's, uh, it's gotten a lot different here in the States these days. Wow. So, uh, and if you did, what would the penalty be? Two years minimum um, prison time. And that's, that's the minimum mandatory. Wow. And that's, yeah, that would really not be fun. I would not like yeah. to be in the American penal system for, for any, any reason.
Yeah, and the American penal system's got a whole set of issues that go. We could talk for hours about that, man. It's um, yeah, it's not like bad. anywhere else. Yeah. No. So yeah, I mean, so you know that that's uh, under these circumstances, you do have to start looking at okay, where do I need to be? What's the kind of violence I'm training for? Now, I do have uh, my cousin. He just uh, signed up as a cop recently, and we got into that a little bit, but. That's not what I was teaching people was headbutting, eye gouging, and stamping on their heads. Cops don't do that. Well, no. well, well having just said that, <laughs> they're not supposed to do that. So we, I was talking to him, and I would say, just train for what you're going to do. Role play with the uh, with the other cops. Ro- like get in the gym, get your tracksuit on. Role play arresting each other. Door work. Uh, police work, control and restraint, prison work. It's really weird. It's its own. You've, I know you've done this kind of training where you kind of move somebody. They're not fully resisting, but they're doing passive resistance. It's a good idea to spend a good few hours messing with that because it's it's very strange. And if all you know is this mm-hmm. and somebody's passively resisting and you crack them in the jaw, it's you that goes to jail. <laughs> Richard, I'm glad you brought that up, man. Um, and I know we're running out of time here, but I do want to touch on this is that, <clears throat> you know, look, like you, I trained for over a decade in this whole reality-based, you know, um, chin jab, chopping in the throat, all that stuff. But when it comes down to it, what generally we use, even in a violent street altercation, is more of that medium force type of stuff where you're having yeah. to kind of like maybe choke someone or, you know, roll around with them. And um, that's why I think jujitsu these days is so great because you kind of kind of get that at least for the one-on-one aspect of it. But yeah. I'm glad that you're bringing that up as far as, <clears throat> listen, there's got to be a better way to train than all of this vicious close quarter combat stuff that kind of meets in the middle as far as like I can defend myself against a really drugged up, violent, angry person, but I yeah. can also not just kill them or maim them. That's for sure. I, I think um... – uh, Joe Rogan and, and Jocko Willink were talking about police, like changing the police training. And they said uh, there should be a Navy Seas, St- SEALs style hell week. So you get rid of the narcissists and psychopaths, you weed mm. them out. Um, and then BJJ training, absolutely. Uh, or, you know, any kind of submission wrestling, obviously you would want to focus on stand up more than being on the ground and you'd want to focus on getting the cuffs on people and you'd want to do two on one and, and make it more like police work. But absolutely just it's time spent, right? It's a, what do you call it? Um, when you're learning to fly a plane, like flight hours, you just got to spend hours and hours doing it so that I don't know when you just fucking ate something and you're a bit full and you got a bit of a cold and then all of a sudden you're wrestling with some fucking screaming lunatic that you don't panic and start screaming, chin jabbing them, going, ah, whilst the kid is videoing you. You've got to keep talking and saying, stop, you know, please stay calm, come this way. And that you're doing your two on ones and you're doing your Russian ties and you're doing, like you said, uh, your side control chokes and, and whatever else, because we've also got to think about how does it look? And we should be protecting people. If you're, if you're a cop or a, or a prison officer, you're not there to smash people's faces and ribs in. You, you've got to try and find a way of restraining them that does the minimum amount of harm. That's what it means to live in a civilized society, as far as I know. Right. <laughs> so as a guy, I mean, you've been doing this <clears throat> a lot longer than I have, honestly, man. And um, I really think that, like you said earlier, this is becoming something that we need more and more of. We need guys like you coming out and coming out of retirement, so to speak. So are you planning on saying, you know, balls to the wall, fuck it, man. Like I need to be doing guys a service and, and putting more relevant information out there. I could do, I could do if there was, if there was a, a, a calling for it, I would be, I'd be happy to do it. One of the things that motivated me to do it is when I look around at 20 year olds now, 20 to 25 year olds, I'm looking at them and going, what the fucking hell? <laughs> this generation of men. I mean, fucking hell, they, they, but they don't, I don't think they really need, uh, uh, the head butting and choking training. They need to, they need to box. They need to go to the gym. They need to lift some heavy shit. They need to eat some red meat or something because you know, the ones like skinny jeans, they're pale, they're miserable and fucking depressed. And they've got the necks bent because they're constantly in their fucking phones. 
I'm looking at them going, you're the next generation of men. <laughs> that's made me, that's made me want to uh, uh, get back into it. Just to, it feels anemic. It feels like a blood vessel with no blood going through it. Yes. Um, and they're a bit floppy, a bit weak, and they're uncertain. And, you know, God bless them. Part of that is the schooling. It's the new propaganda. They're basically, they've been told their whole lives there's something wrong with them because it's uh, the modern education system is so anti-male. Um, all, for boys to be little boys, that means they're bad students. They, there's a, a female uh, educational psychologist who said the problem with modern schooling is schools treat boys like bad girls. So boys aren't good at being girls. They're good at being boys. Right. And we don't, we don't acknowledge that, that difference, that gender and sex difference. And we, we really should do. So a lot of them are browbeaten. I get that. But there's really no excuse to not go to the gym. Gyms are everywhere and they're fucking cheap now. There's no excuse to be all floppy and pale and indecisive. if You're just going to get your shit together. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good, I mean, that's a good way to put it, man. You just need to get your shit together. And um, honestly, though, a lot of young men these days are looking for an older role model. Um, and I right. really feel like you could fill that void for them in some way, shape, or form. Um, they look for an older guy who can handle himself, who's strong. He knows how to deal with everything from not only from women, but also to weights, to self-defense. And I really think that the more of us step up and say, okay, here I am. I'm here to help. Let me help you. And even for free, like I know you do a lot and you know, I do as well. We offer our time for completely for free on YouTube and on other, other avenues. And that's just so vital, so crucial right now. So you know, yeah. thanks for what I, you do, man. And I, I really hope that you put more stuff out um, as far as that goes. I'd, I'd be happy to. I, uh, I wish I had uh, mastered uh, the art of dealing with women. I'll, I'll, probably, I'll probably keep away <laughs> the other <laughs> stuff I can help them with. Women, I'm still trying to figure out. That's, uh, that's like, I think that's a lifelong puzzle, yeah. puzzle yeah. To, uh, to, be, to be dealing with. But yeah, no, I'd, I'd be happy to do that if there's, if there's a calling for it. Um, I do look at the explosion of popularity of, of Jordan Peterson, Jocko Willing's doing really well, Dave Goggins is doing really well. And I do wonder if it's an archetypal first for mm-hmm. uh, p- paternal father figures, like strong father figures, because you're right, there just doesn't seem to be many left. There doesn't seem to be many around. Um, and the message, it's not complicated. It's not like high level psychoanalytic theory or, or something. It's basically giving young men the permission and the right to be men again. Yes. And that's just so needed these days. Mm. The stuff that you once put out, um, offensive psychology, stuff like that, streetfightsecrets.com. Um, that's all still going on. We can still get it. I think so. I think it's still all available. I, I would say, um, there's one course that I did. Uh, it's very good. It's a very, very good course. It's very dangerous, though. It was called. It was. It, it was released in two permutations. One was psychology of violence that you mentioned earlier. Earlier, and before that, there was a really poor audio quality one called Core Visualizations. But it was a culmination of stuff I'd read from Project Jedi, which was the American Army's attempt to create super soldiers. Mm-hmm. It's a real thing for people who haven't looked that up. Um, and the other one was some CIA training, and it was a neurolinguistic programming. In Project Jedi, they hired NLP guys like Anthony Robbins, John Grinder, and Richard Bandler to, to help make the soldiers stronger. So I created this course um, called Psychology of Violence and Core Visualizations. It's good, but uh, in terms of mental health, it's not mentally healthy stuff. I don't know if that was what did you did you used to buy my stuff back in the day? Yeah, yeah, I bought a number of your products back in the day. Okay, okay. So there was this. I created this course for for people who don't know, and it was to make guys able to access the kind of aggression you need to access if you're actually going to do violence to somebody else. But I didn't know because I didn't understand PTSD as well back then. I didn't understand how the unconscious mind uh, operates as well as I do now back then. It was pretty dangerous because it has you visualizing repeatedly doing violence to somebody. Of course, you're, then people would be like, oh, yeah, I feel more aggressive now. Also, I fell out with my girlfriend and I lost my job. And I'm having <laughs> nightmares and I'm really angry on the way to work. And when you're uh, focusing mentally on violence all the time, uh, it's almost like sending a message to the unconscious saying, please create this, please create this. Which So I just wanted to – it is still out there, but 
it's it's good, but maybe give that one a miss if you want to live a happy life. <laughs> I do just want to give a quick plug for that stuff, man. Although you say it's dangerous and everything, which I can I could see where you're coming from with that. It's fucking effective. Um, there's a number of techniques which I still use today. One of them was visualizing triangles around vital spots on people and stuff. Like it's official stuff. Um, I've yeah. I've dude I've run the gamut with all of this stuff as far as like psychology, street fighting. Yours is still some of my favorite all time stuff. So oh, thanks thank for putting that out there. Thank you, mate. Appreciate that. So wrapping up here, man. Um, what's next for you? I know we talked about that you're thinking of kind of coming out of retirement, so to speak, and putting out more psychology of street fighting and also some actual techniques out there, um, as well as maybe kind of doing a little bit of mentoring for the young guys out there. What else do you have in the works? What else is coming down the pipe? Um, at the moment, I have a, a course out that's to help people overcome codependency and people pleaser syndrome, um, which is a pretty, pretty tough course, but it's, it's, it's a good one for reconditioning people. And then hopefully by the beginning of uh, 2021, provided that we, you know, we aren't all apocalypsed by them, I have a book uh, coming out, uh, which will be released in January or February. It's the same publishing house that uh, David Goggins released on the uh, his excellent book, Can't Hurt Me, which I also recommend awesome. people get. Awesome. So um, I know a number of your other courses that you do offer, um, emotional literacy, um, disassociation, if I'm correct, um, discipline, self-assertiveness, um, like various, various other courses besides just the psychology of violence type stuff. So um, you're doing a great service, man. And I thank you so much. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a freaking pleasure, bro. Thank you very much for having me on. Absolute pleasure. Guys, I want you to remember until next time that you are your first and last line of defense. Please go ahead and check out uh, Richard's websites, respectively. They will be linked down below in the, in the description here. And I will catch you in the next Tactical Podcast. Cheers, Mother Flowers. Peace.